everyone. If you're watching this on YouTube, welcome to part number two of lecture number 12, the analysis of microarray data or gene expression data. Um, if you're watching this on Twitch, then thanks for still being here. Um, so we've been talking about normalization, how to do statistical tests and all of these things. But the problem comes in with microarrays because in microarrays you're generally doing 10,000 or 100,000 genes that you measure, right? So you don't do a single statistical test. You do literally 10,000 or 100,000 tests. So in that case, you have to realize that you have a multiple testing issue because when you do your analysis, um, every test that you do, you say, I want to see the p-value being smaller than 0 0.05. Um, and that of course when you do a hundred tests that means that five genes will show a significant difference um, but this is just based on on random chance because hey, every test has a five percent or has a nine as a five percent error rate so if i'm doing a hundred tests then of course each of these tests has an individual error rate so the problem comes in and you have to correct for that right so you can make a type error or type one error which is very common because you're doing 10,000 tests that means that you call a gene significantly different but it's not right it's just because your threshold is too low so you can avoid this type of error by doing a Bonferroni correction the other error is a type two error that means that you are missing a, a significantly change gene, right? So you're saying that based on my statistical test, this gene is not differentially expressed, while in reality it is. So, and you can avoid this type 2 error by doing a Benjamini Hochberg false discovery rate adjustment. Um, and of course, you can only optimize for one of the two, right? If I optimize and say I want to minimize my type 1 errors, then of course I'm going to like have to accept the fact that I'm going to make more type 2 errors. And if I'm minimizing my type 2 error, then I'm going to make more type 1 errors. So in R, when we don't want to do multiple testing adjustment, we can use this p.adjust function. And the p.adjust function has three parameters. The first parameter is the p-value that you got. The second parameter is the type of adjustment that you want to do. For example, I want to minimize my type 1 errors, so I'm going to say Monferroni. And then the third parameter is the total number of tests that you did. So in this case, I say that I did 10 tests, right? So what this statement does, it says correct the p-value for the fact that we have done 10 tests in total, right? And the number of tests performed normally corresponds to the number of probes or the number of genes that you have measured on your array. So this third number will generally be in the order of like 10,000, 20,000, or even 100,000, depending on which microarray you're using. And the nice thing about the p.adjust function is you're, it doesn't, you don't have to do this one by one, right? You don't have to do, write a for loop and go through all of the p-values, adjusting them one by one. You can just give it like 100,000 p-values in one go, and then, hey, you say 100,000, and it will adjust all of the p-values um, for you, and you don't have to worry about the fact that you have to write a for loop. Good, so now we know, right, which genes are really differentially expressed because hey, we, we did our microarrays, we scanned them, we did background correction, we do normalization, then we do statistical tests, then we adjust our tests, and then we are live, left with a, a list of genes, hopefully it's a small list of genes, and all of these genes are differentially expressed. And now we want to know if they have anything in common, right? So the next step would then be either do gene ontology or use like a pathway analysis. So pathway analysis we already discussed in lecture six, um, and that would mean that you take CAG and then you look at the pathway that you're interested in and then you say, okay, so now take this CAG pathway and overplot um, the data that I have onto it, right? So for each gene, I know if it's up-regulated, I know if it's down-regulated. Um, so color the up-regulated genes green and color the down-regulated genes red. And then you can reason about what happens in the pathway. Another way of doing this is gene ontology, right? Imagine that I have no idea which pathway might be involved or which biological process might be affected. Um, then gene ontology is something that I can use to figure out in which direction I should look. So gene ontology is a project which is a collaborative effort to address the need for consistent descriptions of gene products across databases. So gene ontology 
has three different pillars. So gene ontology comes in cellular component, biological process and molecular function. So the cellular component, has, so every gene has these three annotations. So it has an annotation saying that um, this gene is located in the endoplasmatic reticulum or this gene is, is active in the nucleus. Um, it can also tell you, for example, if, it, if there's a gene product group, right? The, the, the cellular component is also, for example, the ribosome or it's a proteasome or it's, it's a certain protein dimer, right? So cellular components are where in the cell is this gene normally found to be active. Biological process is another tree which is subdivided in all kinds of sub subdivisions of biological process and a biological process is defined as a series of events accomplished by one or more organized assemblies of molecular functions. So a biological process is not really equivalent to a pathway but it is very similar, right? A biological process might be DNA replication. Molecular function is, uh, it describes the activity of the gene that occurs at the molecular level. And so molecular functions generally correspond to activities that can be performed by individual gene products, but some activities are performed, assembled by complexes. So it's, it's more or less, a, 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 it's very similar to a biological process, um, but the molecular function might be breaking down of uh, amino acids. And, and the biological process that belongs to that is um, degradation, right? It's the degradation process or the protein degradation process. So molecular functions generally are smaller than biological processes. So how does this look? Well, if we look at the biological process tree, then here we see all the way on the top, we see biological process. So gene ontology said, if we look at biological process, there are two different biological processes. We have cellular processes, which occur within a cell, and we have metabolic processes. So metabolic processes are belong to the metabolome, right? So and we have cellular processes, which are defined as either cellular metabolic processes, and metabolic processes can be either cellular metabolic processes or small molecule metabolic processes. And then you see that this kind of gets split out into smaller and smaller groups, and head the further down you get to the tree, the more um, exact a certain group becomes. And so you see, for example, we have fat soluble vitamins, metabolic processes, or vitamin K, or quinona cofactors, right? And this tree is very big. This is just a very small part of the tree. So when you do a gene ontology analysis, right? So you take the genes, and so every gene in the genome has their ontology annotated, more or less. Um, and then what you do is you you do an over or under representation test on your list of differentially expressed genes. So imagine that I have a list of genes and I think that these genes are, so these genes came up in my analysis and they are the genes which are different um, from, um, for example, treated versus untreated cells. Then how does the result from a gene ontology over representation analysis looks? Well, it looks like this. So the biological process itself is not affected, but then you see that the further down the tree you come, the more um, it starts becoming significant, right? So here you see that, no, the thing, what all these genes have in common is it's a cellular metabolic process and the process which was most affected is, for example, the photosynthesis pathway, right? And that that's how it works. So hey, it takes this list of genes, looks to see, okay, so you have 50 genes in your list. In the whole genome, there are 150 genes annotated to this process. Then it looks to see if the ratio of your genes in your whole set of genes is different from the ratio of these annotations in the whole genome. So and besides that, and we want to not only know where these things are located, but we also want to visualize this, right? We want to, when we write a paper, we have to show our readers that what is happening in our analysis, what is happening in, in the experiment that we did. Um, so this is my um, list of propositions for my thesis. Um, so when I did my PhD, um, if you do it in Holland, then near next to your PhD thesis, which is like this book where there's 
couple of hundred pages in there describing which papers you published and what kind of research you did um, you also have a list of propositions so one of my propositions was that there is no good communication on big data between statisticians and biologists without proper visualizations right because if you are a statistician you speak a completely different language than a biologist and if you want to communicate together then you then you need to have a certain language which you can share right so uh, it, you need to create images or diagrams or animations um, to communicate your message as a bioinformatician or as a statistician to other people, um, for example, biologists. Right. So, and of course, this becomes incredibly important when you're dealing with like large number of genes. Hey, if I have 150 genes which are differentially expressed, hey, then how do I communicate which genes those were and and how? how much differential expression I saw. And so then you need to use visualizations. So the most common way of visualizing things is heat maps. So heat maps show you, for example, if certain tissues are different. So here I created a heat map uh, where I compare the hypothalamus tissues with the gonadal fat tissue. And what we can see very clearly here is that hypothalamus has a completely different expression profile than, um, for example, the gonadal fat. Right, because hey, here you can see that the the, the 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 yellow part means that they are more similar, and red means that they are different. Yeah, so you can see that, for example, gonadal fat 513 is very uh, similar to gonadal fat. 514. Hey, you can also see that hypothalamus uh, 514 is is very similar to hypothalamus uh, 527. Right, so if you want to make a heat map in R, um, then it will just take a matrix, right? So if you have your matrix of differentially expressed genes or you have your matrix with all of the genes in there, and then what you can say is just say heat map my matrix. So the matrix function or the heat map function has, has a couple of important parameters. So one of the parameters or two of the parameters are rho v and col v. So these determine if there is a dendrogram attached to your histogram, right? I could say I want to cluster both in the uh, x or in the x direction, and I want to cluster also on the y axis, and that that is determined by setting rho v and col v to true or false. So if if I set rho v to false, then this tree would not be clustered. Besides that, we also have the scale parameter. So the scale parameter of the heat map function says that if if you say scale is 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 for example um, rows and then what it will do for every row it will calculate the mean and then make all of the colors relative to the mean you can also color of course by or you can also scale by the columns yeah, so then the same thing happens for each column it will calculate the mean and then the colors will be relative to this mean value in general, I always say to people that if you do a heat map, you should first set the scale to none. So, welcome back. Look at the packages. I got them. Good. So, heat map, right? So, we can make a heat map. Heat maps can be made sample to sample or gene to gene if we wanted to. Um, here I'm plotting samples versus samples. We can see that hypothalamus samples are clustering very well with hypothalamus samples. A rho v col v um, allows you to determine if there is going to be a dendrogram on the top and on the side and if it should reorder them. Besides that we have the scale function always set scale to none in the first instance right because then it won't start rescaling based on rows or column means um, and besides that what you generally want to use is for example a row side color or a col side color. Um, that means that it will add an additional bar here and using this, you can you can color, so you can add colors for different groups that you have in your data, right? So I could add a little bar here, um, which colors, for example, blue for for males, and which colors orange or pinkish for females, right? So then I can see if the females cluster together as well as the males clustering together. So it allows me to just add a additional bar with colors um, and I can do that for the rows and I can also do that for the columns of course so I can add two different um, bars saying that well these are for example the tissues and on the other side I want to have blue for males and pink for females besides that of course like we already saw one of the most common visualizations used is dendrograms or phylogenetic trees um, so 
I wanted to talk a little bit about dendrograms because dendrograms, um, we already made a couple, right? They are based on similarity between expression profiles. But of course, similarity is something which is mathematically very hard to capture. So there are three different distance measurements which are all related to each other. And I write down the formulas here, not just because I want you guys to know the formulas, um, but because I think that if you see the formulas, you see that they are all related, right? So imagine that we have X and Y. So X and Y are, for example, sample one and sample two, right? So for sample one, I have measured 10,000 genes. For sample two, I've also measured 10,000 genes. Um, so what do I do when I calculate Manhattan distance? Well, I look at the first gene, the expression level, and then subtract the expression level of the same gene in sample number two. And then I do that for all of the probes. So for, for the first probe up until P um, that I have, right? So 10,000. And every time I calculate, so I just subtract the one from the other, and then these mean that I make it absolute, right? So then I'm calculating something which is called a Manhattan distance. Besides Manhattan distance, I can also do a Euclidean distance. So Euclidean distance is more or less the same, but now we square the difference. So we again go from one to all of the probes, we square the difference every time before summing it up, and then once we summed up everything, we take the square root of the total number that we computed. This is called Euclidean distance, and Euclidean distance puts more weight on, um, or on genes which are larger expressed, right? Because the, this, the, the 5 to the power of 2 becomes 25, while 4 to the power of 2 only becomes 16, right? So, and in Manhattan distance, I would have just said five plus four, and here I'm saying 25 plus 16. Of course, I'm taking the square root in the end to make sure that, that it's more or less in a similar range, um, but had the Euclidean distance puts more um, weight on large differences than it puts on, on small differences. And then you have the generalization of this, and this is called the Minowski distance. And Minowski distance is more or less the same as Manhattan distance and Euclidean distance, and because Minowski distance, where we say m is 1, reverts back to Manhattan distance. If we say m is 2, then it reverts back to Euclidean distance. But of course, Minowski distance allows us to use any scaling factor that we want. So we can say um, use m is 10, right? So then I'm saying compute the distance, do it to the power of 10, sum them all up, and then in the end take the, not the square root, but the, the tenth square root, right? So the square root where 10 is the base. Um, and these are three different distance measurements, yeah, but of course the Minowski distance is just the generalization of Manhattan and Euclidean distance. So of course this now allows me to, to define a score saying that how distant two samples are from each other, right? So that's what you see in a dendrogram, and that's what is visualized, the distance between two samples. Um, and hey, you can have things which are very distant to each other, but also things which are very close. Good, so little example, hey, when we do profile one and profile two, so this is just the profile of sample one, profile of sample two, just some numbers, we calculate the Manhattan distance, we calculate the Euclidean distance, and you can see that in the end it's not that much different, um, but it can give you some significant differences depending on um, what you look at. So the Euclidean distance kind of skews your visualization or your tree towards like large distances having more weight, while Manhattan distance puts a single difference, just is a single difference. All right, so when we do di uh, dendrograms, have we need to have a distance between individual i and individual j, right? So uh, when we do hierarchical clustering uh, to create these dendrograms, uh, we have a matrix of elements um, where, um, where each element says the distance between sample one and sample two, or sample three and sample two. Right, so all elements are of course positive because distance measurements are always positive. You can't have a negative distance because that means that you're more similar than equal. Um, and so of course in this in these kinds of distance matrices, the um, the the um, the diagonal is always zero 
right? Something compared with itself is always exactly identical. So exactly identical is zero and very different is for example nine, right? So, and here it means that smaller distance is that you are more similar. So the profile, so across the whole 10,000 genes, eh, if you get a value of 15, then you're more similar than when you get a value of 150. Of course, these matrices, these distance matrices are, are symmetrical because the distance from I to J is the same as the distance from J to I, right? So number one has a value of one to two and number two has a value of one to two one, right? So it's, it's, it, it's symmetrical. Um, of course the dimension is n times n and generally we do n being the number of genes because we, we want to generally know if genes are, are showing the same expression profile or we can do it also across samples and then we want to see if samples have similar expression profile. So how do you now do hierarchical clustering? Now this is very similar to what we showed or to what I showed you guys last time when you do a, a multiple pairwise alignment. So the start of the procedure means you search for the smallest elements in the distant matrix. Here it's the distance from one to two, which has a distance of one. And then we form a cluster. So we group one and two together and then we calculate a new distance matrix. And that's how we group. Right, so this is the first branch in the tree and then we get the second branch in the tree by looking at the smallest one, which is two, right? So now we would group four with five. But now we get an issue, right? Because now when we have to calculate the distance of this group towards another group, then how do we do that, right? Because we have two profiles in this group and we can't really compare two profiles or the average of two profiles to, to another profile, right? So, so if we want to calculate the distance between a cluster and an individual profile, we have three different ways of doing this. We can use something which is called single linkage, right? So the distance between a cluster and a profile is computed as the distance between the two most similar elements in the two clusters. And then this is called single linkage. We can also use complete linkage. So instead of computing the distance of a cluster to a profile by taking the two things which are most similar, we can also take the two things which are most dissimilar. And then we talk about complete linkage, right? So now we compute the distance between a cluster or be between a cluster and a profile or two clusters as the distance between the two most dissimilar elements in the cluster. And then we have um, average linkage, which is also called up GMA. Um, and then when we calculate the distance from two clusters A and B, we take the average of all distances between pairs of objects in X and A and Y and B. So we take the mean distance between the elements in a cluster towards a profile. Um, so let me do a little drawing. Should I do a little drawing? I think I'm going to do a little drawing since there's only Misha and Xanaxin and my moderator, why not do a little drawing? I haven't drawn in, uh, in some time. Um, so let me just calculate this, right? So let me see if this works. Let's go to draw, let's take a pen, right? So in, for free, no, yeah, this is going to be for free. Yeah. Drawings are always welcome. All right, right, so hey, imagine that we have, so, not paid. Shut up and check my channel points. <laughs> All right, let's do a little drawing, right? So hey, we have, for example, um, a cluster, right? So, and of course, distances can also be represented on a 2D plane, right? So if we have like a, a, a profile here, right? And we have a profile here, then we can calculate the distance between these two profiles. That's going to be very small. Right, so that, that's kind of the distance, right? So in this distance is just the, the distance between these two points, right? And then we can have a point here, and we can have a point here, and another point here, and another point here, right? So, so what happens now is if we have these five samples, right? Each of these five samples, we compute the distance and we, we visualize the distance like this, right? So now first we find the two points which are most similar. Right, so these two points are the most similar. So this is going to be our first cluster, like one comma two. Right, so now when we want to group the next closest thing to the cluster, right, we can take, which is this one, of course, right, now we can compute two ways of distance. And this is a little bit difficult because I actually didn't have a, 
good so let me move one of the points a little bit right so let's move the one point a little bit closer to this one right so now when we do single linkage then the the distance between this cluster and this point is defined as this distance right because this is the closest one so we take the one the most similar element from this cluster and then compute the distance so we say that the distance between cluster and this profile or this point here is the blue line if we would take the complete linkage we would take the most dissimilar object so that's the one that's farthest away right so this line is longer than the other line so now we say that no this is the this is the distance between the cluster and the point if we would take up GMA right we would calculate both distances and then we would take the average of it right so we would take kind of a, a green line right so the green line is the average between the red line and this point so it, it ends up being well not at one of the points but it ends up kind of in the middle of these two points right so blue here is single linkage complete linkage is the red line and the green line is up GMA of course up GMA is, is computationally much more heavy because we have to calculate all of the distances and then do the average of it right but now we we group and we make a new cluster right so the new cluster will now include the third point right and now we start doing the same thing so now we say that hey, we have now um, one comma two towards three is a certain distance so towards three is a certain distance right and that's the distance that is being plotted in a tree so if I go back here right and it would show you the dendrogram again then at this um, oh, dendrogram is here right so then this is the distance between one and two right so that's the height here at the at the graph which is from 0 to 14 right but if we go back and we had, so this is an iterative process so we go through it one by one every time again and so if we go back to the drawing window right then now we would have defined a new cluster and now because we now need to know which of these points is the closest so let me remove the coloring right so and this is then the, the midpoint of the cluster yeah, but now of course we we see that we get very different distance measurements right because now if we would look at single linkage to the next closest point right then this would be this distance right because this point is the closest to this one but if we would take the complete linkage then it would compute the distance from this point all the way to this point right so it would show you a much much bigger distance and of course if we do up GMA then of course the distance ends up being somewhere in the middle of these three points so then this is the distance right so depending on which type of clustering we do we get a certain tree and these trees can be can be exactly similar but they can also be different so that is one of these issues with with the, the computation of um, hierarchical clustering right so if we do hierarchical clustering the, cl the the way that the dendrogram is formed can be significantly different compared to when we use single linkage compared to when we use complete linkage right and that is because in one case we use the most similar elements to calculate the total distance and in the other case if we use we use the most dissimilar elements so generally when you do clustering remember that there are three different ways of building your tree so every distance matrix that you have in the end comes with three completely different or could be completely different trees in, in, in many cases these trees would look exactly the same the only thing which would be different is the scale right it's an iterative process so we search for the smallest element then we form a cluster we calculate the distance matrix and we repeat until everything is merged right so if we would look at our little example we would merge one and two then we would merge four and five and then we would merge three together with cluster four and five because that has a distance of three and then we end up with two clusters and then we would merge these two clusters right so here we would have a, a dendrogram and this dendrogram would look a little bit like this right because if we go here let me actually make this active right so our dendrogram in this case would look like this uh, 
get it all away. Um, yeah, so we would have the first cluster, which is one versus two. They would be very closely related because they have a distance of one, right? Then we would have another cluster, four versus five, which has a distance of two. So it has the double distance. Right, and now we would have the distance, uh, so now we would have three, right, and three was closest to the other two, so it would have, so three had a distance of um, three, so here we would have then three, which would come here, so double the distance again, and then the distance between um, all of them would be four, so we would end up with the last line connecting the two clusters, which would make, give us a distance of four. Right, so here we have uh, one distance, this is two distance, this is three distance, and this is four distance, and this is the cluster of one versus two, and this is the cluster of four and five, and this is the one of three. Right, so this is then in the end the dendrogram that we would get, and so we can remove these here, and then in the end we get something which looks like this. Right, so here we would have our scale, um, one, two, three, and Four, right? So this would be our dendrogram. Of course, if we use it, if we use complete linkage, then the distances in this tree would be different compared to using single linkage. So that is how these things are built. This is how you you make a dendrogram if you would do it by hand. And of course, like the, the clustering algorithm that you use does it for you. So you can use like hierarchical clustering, but all of these clustering methods have three different linkage methods and your tree will look different based on which linkage you select. So there is no one proper tree. It is, uh, there's no one tree that represents the evolutionary distance between all animals on this planet. There's actually three different graphs or three different dendrograms that you can make based on which, um, distance profile you choose or which way you choose to summarize these clusters and compute the distance from a cluster to a new profile or a cluster between another cluster. All right, so then for the last part, I wanted to show you a couple of historical visualizations of gene expression data, which have been used to show people how many genes are differentially expressed. So the first one is the MA plot. It's a type of bland Altman plot and it I think it was invented more or less in the 1980s already. So on the x-axis we show A, which is defined as the mean expression value of a gene across the whole experiment. And then on the y-axis we show M, and M is the log 2 ratio, right? So it assumes that you have only two conditions. So it assumes that you have a ratio, for example, you have disease tissue versus uh, healthy tissue. Right, so, and in that case, had these MA plots look like this, right? So here we see A, right? So we see that here, for example, at 10, had that this gene here, this little dot, had an, had an expression level on average of 10, and in, it was minus, almost minus one, right? So that means that this gene was almost twice as much expressed in the one sample compared to the other sample. Right? And of course, the genes which are interesting, of course, are the genes which have a relatively high expression and the genes which show a relatively high difference between the groups. Right? Because in the end, there's two things that count. Right? It's not just the, the difference between the two samples, it's also the expression level. Right? If you are a highly expressed gene in one sample and you go to be a lowly expressed gene in another sample, right, then your ratio will be, will be very big. But your average expression will be more or less lower because of the big difference. Right? So these MA plots, hey, they have like a twofold difference is more or less considered as significant. But then you also penalize for having very low expression. Right? So a very low expression level is, is, is considered to be not really interesting you need to have a high expression level and a high difference before you become an interesting gene. The volcano plot tries to visualize the same thing. So the x-axis shows m, which is the log ratio, so the difference between the samples, uh, between the two groups that you are comparing. And then on the y-axis we now not show, so here we show instead of the, um, so the volcano plot puts the y-axis of the MA plot on the x-axis, and then on the y-axis we show the lot score. So it is this 
the significance, right? So it's the minus log 10 of the significance. So why do we use the significance here? And that is because if there is a lot of variation, right? So then it might be that the difference between the two groups is big. But if the variation in these groups is also big, then it's not really interesting because the difference is not that significant, right? And this is something that the, uh, that the MA plot does not show you. So a volcano plot looks like this, and these are really nice plots to make. So this is one I think that Manuel did. Um, and what we see here is we see the log to ratio, so M, right? So we see here, for example, minus two, which means that um, this gene here was four times lower expressed in one sample than it was in the other sample, right? And then here we see the minus log 10 P value. And what we see here is that the, p the minus log 10 of the p-value is almost zero, right? Which means that although the, differences, the difference was really big, this gene is probably not that interesting, right? Because of the fact that the p-value is very small, right? So it had a big difference, but also a big variance. So the genes which are very interesting are the ones that are coming out of the volcano here on the top, right? So here we see that we have a p-value for this gene of 1 times 10 to the minus 15. And then when we look, we see indeed that there was kind of a fourfold difference between the samples. The same thing here, we see now a gene which is upregulated. Again, 10, uh, uh, the p value for differential expression was 1 times 10 to the minus 14. And we see that this was almost at 2 to the power of 4, which is almost 16 times higher in, in one of the samples compared to the other sample. Right, so it's the volcano plots and the MA plots are a way of visualizing like large amount of data and then generally the interesting genes are the ones that are more or less floating in this area on the top. So the interesting upregulated genes and the interesting downregulated genes or the other way around, right? Because you can define what your sample is. Good. I hope that that's clear. Um, I don't think that we're going to make a volcano plot, but they are really fun to make because you can do a lot of things with the coloring and how to color them and statistic or mathematically they're they're interesting because you can hey you can use like a, a circle formula to kind of color all of these dots being like black and hey you can make the volcano look really really beautiful, um, which helps getting your publication accepted. Good. So we talked a lot about microarray data. During the assignments, we will use some microarray data from our group, um, the data set that I've been talking about. So the one which shows you the, um, the hypothalamus and the gonadal fat in these three different types of mice. So our Berlin fat mouse, the standard laboratory mouse, and a cross between the two. Um, but if you want to do science at home, you can do that. Um, because there are two major databases which contain literally thousands of microarrays for free, which is a, a, a massive resource because you have to imagine that every one of these microarrays costs around $80. So if you would, would want to do like 100 microarrays, then you pay around 8,000 euros for that. So we have a collaborative effort called Gene Expression Omnibus, which is driven by the NCBI, so the, the American Bioinformatics Institute. And these store around 25,000 experiments and there are 600,000 microarrays that you can download for free. And all of these are relatively well annotated. So it tells you this was a microarray done on humans. Um, and this was cancer tissue, lung cancer taken from a patient, which was this age and some other parameters, right? But then the drawback of gene expression omnibus is, is that it's storage and retrieval only. So, hey, you can store your data there and you can retrieve your data um, or anyone can retrieve your data, but there are no analysis tools on the website to kind of do a pre-screening or if microarrays might be, might be interesting, right? The other website is Array Express. They have a very, very big archive, even bigger than the Gene Expression Omnibus. So there's like 24,000 experiments. They have around 700,000 microarrays that you can download. But the nice thing is, is that they have something which is called the Gene Expression Atlas. And the Gene Expression Atlas is a curated, re-annotated part of their archive data. So that means again that a human looked at it and says, yes, 
this microarray was really done on a B6 mouse on brain tissue um, at this age of the mouse, right? So they, they call the researchers and they check, double check the data, make sure that everything is uploaded correctly and that you can more or less be, uh, that you can rely that the data or that the annotation of the data is correct. Um, it has much less experiments, but there are like 130,000 arrays in there. And so if you want to do some differential gene expression at home, like if you're interested in lung cancer, um, just go to the gene expression atlas, download some standard lung tissue microarrays, download some lung cancer microarrays, and then just compare them see which genes come up, see if you can find any pathways involved in lung cancer or hey, if you're not interested in lung cancer but you're interested in obesity um, then also you can have things like fat tissue in mice and you can have mice on high fat diet, low fat diet, um, you can get all kinds of different tissues like the liver, the skeletal muscle and it's a really really strong and like massively valuable database to kind of look around and see if you can find data which which you can use and almost always there are microarray data sets available for the thing that you want to investigate um, so it doesn't only contain like mice and humans there's also plants in there and, and bacteria and so anything that you're interested in there's almost always guaranteed to be some kind of an experiment and you can get really really high scoring publications out of it um, there are science papers written by people that did not spend a dime doing their own microarrays but that just reanalyzed like 10,000 arrays from GEO and that, that is one of these things is that as a bioinformatician hey, you don't always have to set up your own experiments like a biologist you don't have to grow your own plants or breed your own mice because there is so much data already out there and available for free hey, you can get really nice high scoring publications by just read or by downloading data um, harmonizing across different experiments and then drawing conclusions about what happened um, in the different experiments that we're looking at the nice thing about EBI is that it also has some analysis tools which makes it easier to see or to screen if microarrays might be useful for the experiment that you're doing. Um, yeah, because you can kind of compare uh, microarrays done on brain in mouse from one experiment to microarrays done in brain in another experiment and then you can see if they are very different from each other or if they are already very similar before you start downloading the data. So this is how Geo looks. Um, hey, you just have the website, so hey, we can go to the website, click around a little bit. Um, but hey, it's just hey, you can browse by data set, by series, by platforms, and by samples. So platforms are different types of microarrays. Um, so here you can see that there's almost 1.3 million microarrays in there. So samples that have been done on microarrays. Um, Array Express is uh, more or less similar, um, so hey, it has uh, 55,000 experiments and there's uh, 1.6 million microarrays in there. If you want to download all of the data, in this case they tell you it would cost you 27 terabytes of hard drive storage to store all of the data that they are storing. And you can get this for free, right? So hey, just take a basic number as like 80 dollars per microarray um, that means that here you have at least um, 1.6 million times 80 dollars um, that's that's something that's big so 1.6 million um, times 80 um, you end up with a data set that you can download for free which is worth or which people spend 128 million dollars on to collect and you can get that for free it's like insane like they are giving away a hundred and twenty eight million dollars and you can just download it good so that's the end of the lecture I'm very sorry for the for the packages that I had to get um, like it broke my flow and I didn't expect there to be like these big packages um, but today I told you about gene expression right the questions that you can ask like which genes are different in which tissues how are tissues different from each other how is cancer different from non-cancer cells um, I showed you guys that you can use microarrays I told you about the history of microarrays a little bit about how they are made um, which steps you have to go through to get your sample on a microarray um, I talked about normalization so 
that there's normalizations of scores and normalization of um, ratios, that you have normalization that that quantile normalization is the most commonly used method nowadays to analyze microarray data, but also that before you can do actually these normalization steps, you have to do all kinds of normalizations based on background, scratches, non-specific hybridization. Besides that, we talked about statistical analysis, right? That if you are doing tens or hundreds of thousands of statistical tests, that you run the risk of multiple testing issues, which means that you are calling genes differentially expressed while they're actually not, just because you did so many tests. I told you about gene ontology, um, the pathway analysis I didn't talk about today because we already did that when we discussed CAG and Reactome. Um, but gene ontology is one of these tools where when you do these kinds of fishing expeditions and you have no idea what might come up, um, it can tell you that no, um, all of the genes that you find differentially expressed are located in the mitochondria. So there might be an issue with the mitochondria of the animal that you're looking at. Or hey, the, the, the experiment that you did where you compared cancer with non-cancer samples, um, all of this has to do with the ribosome. So it might be that something in the ribosome is causing or is, is, is interest or is interesting to look at when it comes to these types of cancer. I told you about common visualizations like heat maps and dendrograms and how to do them in R, a little bit of the parameters. Um, of course, look at the help files. There's like, I think that the heat map function has like 15 different parameters and we only discussed three. Um, but for dendrograms, I told you about hierarchical clustering and that for each distance matrix that you compute, there are three different um, dendrograms or three different trees that you can build based on the fact that you do single linkage, complete linkage or up GMA. Furthermore, I told you about some historical plots like the MA plot and the volcano plot yeah, so that they are different ways of visualizing hundreds of thousands of genes and kind of showing that there are interesting groups. Um, and I told you where you can get a bunch of free microarray data so that you can do your own analysis and like the people in the conspiracy theory group say, do your own research. Well, in this case, it is definitely possible to do your own research because, like I said, there's almost $128 million freely available data for you to download and look at. Good, so that was my story for you guys for today. Um, found aquatic gastropod arrays. Yeah, I told you there would be microarrays and, and there's probably not just a single tissue, but there's probably multiple tissue arrays as well, right? So if you're interested in, in how are these two snails different from each other, um, then, then you can actually, you can actually do that. Like you don't have to be part of a university or, or spend a lot of money. Um, no, you can just go there, analyze the data that's available and see if you can find new stuff. Because all of these experiments that are in there, right? People generally only look within their own experiment and then they compare like their results to kind of what other people found. But in a lot of cases, just downloading like 50 different experiments that all kind of looked at the same thing can give you a much better overview of what's going on and which genes might be involved or which genes might be very good therapeutic targets. Um, so a lot of free microarray data, uh, like awesome stuff. Um, it's one of these resources that like a lot of people don't know about, um, but once you know about it, you, you keep using it over and over again. Every time that we end up with doing our own microarray experiment, um, the first thing that I do is see if I can find like five or six different mouse strains that other people have already done. Yeah, because we work on the Berlin fat mouse, but other people are working on the New Zealand obese mouse, or people are working on the DBA2 mouse, right? And, and by combining or looking across all of these different experiments, you get a much higher level overview, like a more, more bird's eye view of what's happening um, compared to just focusing only on your experiment with your five samples versus the other five samples. Good, so if there's no more questions, then uh, I'm going to start calling some people to see if I can get rid of the packages that I got. And uh, for now, um, thank you very much. If you're watching this on YouTube, like, subscribe, favorite, hit the bell icon and that kind of crap. Um, if you are watching this on Twitch, I thank you very, very much. Uh, 
my moderator Misha and Xanaxin for for being here today and, and, and enjoying it uh, of course if you're watching it on YouTube you're more than welcome to join next week next week we're going to do something fun because I will be talking a little bit about um, let me see what the next one is um, documents PPTX um, Bioinformatics. So next week I will be talking about literature management. So how do you download papers and use papers? What are citations? Why do we use citations? And these kinds of things um, that will be mixed with a little bit of standards for analysis. So what kind of different file types do we commonly use? We discussed a whole bunch of them already like FASTA and but I just want to give you an overview. And then we will have a talk by Amy who will talk about her master project. Um, she's a student or a previous student of mine. Um, she's now not in Berlin anymore. I think she's somewhere in Bern, Switzerland, I think. Um, but um, she will talk about her camera trap project and how she uses machine learning um, to analyze photos from camera traps and to determine what animal walked in front of the trap or walked into the trap. So that's it for me. Um, thank you very much and see you next time.